On the 10th of May 1940, the German army invaded the Netherlands and five days later, the Dutch command signed the unconditional surrender. Hitler had expected that the Netherlands would have been taken in just one day. So something went wrong. What? In this video, I'm going to talk about the German invasion of the Netherlands, also known as the Battle of the Netherlands. Hey, welcome back regular viewers. If you're new, welcome to History Hustle. I'm Stefan, history teacher, hustling history for you. If you like this content, please consider subscribing. Also hit the notification bell to join the hustle. Let's start. Just like in the beginning of the First World War, the Dutch government took a position of neutrality. The Dutch high command wasn't so sure about the fact that it would work this time as well. See, the original German plan of attack during the First World War, the von Schlieffen plan, would include an invasion of the Netherlands. And one of the reasons the German army didn't invade the Netherlands later was because the war became a stalemate that dragged on for many years. So the German army needed its resources at the Western Front. In the 1930s, Dutch General Reinders wasn't so sure that the Netherlands would be lucky again if another war would break out. The problem was the Dutch army at the time had suffered severe budget cuts. It lacked professional staff, trained soldiers and war material. General Reinders proposed some draconic plans to modernize the Dutch army with the purchase of artillery, anti-tank guns, anti-aircraft guns, airplanes, panzer wagons and tanks. However, years of budget cuts made these plans hard to realize. On the 28th of August 1939, only a few days before the Second World War would break out, the Dutch army mobilized. General Reinders became the commander of land and sea forces. From the get-go, General Reinders got into arguing with other members of the Dutch High Command as well the Dutch Minister of Defense how to carry out a proper defense because several lines needed to be reinforced. I'm talking about the IJssel line, the Grebbe line and the New Holland Water line. On the 31st of January 1940, General Reinders resigned and was replaced by General Winkelmann. And General Winkelmann, with the limited resources he had, chose for the Grebbe line to become the main line of defense when the Germans would invade the Netherlands. The area in front of the Grebbe line was inundated, means flooded. The water would be too shallow to cross by boat, but too deep to cross by panzer wagon. So this would be an ideal defense. The problem was that the area of the Grebbeberg, berg means mountain in Dutch, was higher ground. So this area could not be flooded. So if the Germans would carry out a land attack, the attack would come here on the Grebbeberg. On the evening of the 9th of May, one day before the Germans would launch their invasion, he left his office and he said to his colleagues, now they can come. We've done what we could. I'm going home to catch some hours of sleep. And only a few hours later, the first German troops would set foot on Dutch soil. Now the first troops that came into the Netherlands were German troops in Dutch uniforms. Yep, they wore Dutch uniforms and fabricated Dutch helmets. Now their goal was to make it to the ISIL bridges and dismantle the bombs underneath them. In some cases these patrols were intercepted by Dutch border guards. Other patrols made it through only to see the bridges had been blown up in front of them. And in one occasion the infiltration patrol was on the very bridge when it got blown up. Panzer trains that made it to the ISIL line couldn't carry on because the bridges were blown up. After some skirmishes, the Dutch retreated to the Grebbe line according to plan. In the south of the Netherlands, in the province of North Brabant, German panzer trains smashed through the Dutch lines. A Dutch major that was stationed there couldn't believe his eyes because of A, the war had broken out and B, the war was on his very spot. When the first German train rushed by, he looked weird and he asked his troops, does our army have these type of trains? And he could not even finish his sentence before machine gun bullets flew around his ears and he had to take cover. Now this example shows that many Dutch soldiers 
weren't mentally prepared for war. The Germans pushed through. Meanwhile, on the Gebbeberg, the German onslaught was nigh. Till the very last moment, Dutch soldiers were preparing their defenses by cutting down trees, laying telephone cables and reinforcing their trenches. A Dutch sergeant wrote, Together with a captain, I was cutting down trees. It was ludicrous that we still hadn't done that up to this point. On the 11th of May 1940, Germans attacked the Gebberberg. Wehrmacht and SS units mopped up the frontal post and the next day they took the front line. Now, one incident that proves how chaotic the communication at the side of the defenders was, was the action of Major Jacometti. He was a Dutch major that was stationed on the stop line, the last resort of defense, most likely here in this trench. And he thought that only a very few Germans had taken the front line. So he proposed a counter attack. He drew his sword and stormed forward. And according to his men, he said, long live the queen, death to the Huns. His attack first came under fire by his fellow troops who weren't aware that a counter-attack was going on. And second, the Germans, who were in much greater numbers than Major Jacometti had anticipated, drove the attackers back. Major Jacometti was killed in action. Now the front line had fallen and it was one last resort, the stop line. Dutch High Command knew that a proper counter-attack had to be undertaken. Keep watching to find out what happened. So let's take a look at the German attack from the air. This happened in two ways. First, there were the German paratroopers, the so-called Fallschirmjäger, soldiers that jumped from an airplane, opened up their parachute, landed on the ground, gathered up their ammunition to carry out their mission. The second way were the so-called air landing troops that were German troops that were basically positioned in a plane. The plane landed in the Netherlands, for example, on an airstrip. They hopped out to carry out their mission and then ideally the plane would take off, fly back to Germany to get another batch of soldiers. Now the German plan was to seize the bridges near Dordrecht and in Rotterdam to make sure the German panzer units that came rushing from the south of the Netherlands could make their way to the hearth of the Netherlands. Now the most ambitious plan was to be carried out by air landing troops at The Hague. There, German units had to march to the governmental city and capture the Queen, the Dutch Army High Command and the Dutch government, a checkmate as it were. Now, not everything went according to plan. In Dordrecht, the German troops managed to seize the bridges, mostly due to the fact that the Dutch soldiers were taken by total surprise. However, the Germans did suffer some severe losses. Now in Rotterdam, German troops managed to control the bridges only to be pinned down by Dutch soldiers and Marines. Around The Hague, the situation was utterly chaotic. There, German troops landed at the airstrip of Ippenburg. Dutch soldiers, however, taken by total surprise, rushed to their machine guns and started firing on the German airplanes that had landed on their strip. Soon, the whole airstrip was filled by burning wreckages. And as a result of this, the next batch of airplanes, they couldn't land because the whole airstrip was filled by burning wreckages. So they had to land in nearby grass fields. Result of this, they couldn't get back up again and also the attackers were totally scattered. Now, eventually the attackers managed to occupy Ippenburg only to be driven out by a counterattack of the defenders. And this also happened on the other airstrips of Ockenburg and Valkenburg. The Dutch managed to capture 1000 German army personnel and the remaining German units fled, led by General von Sponeck. Only not in the direction of The Hague because this direction was blocked by Dutch troops. So the ambitious move to capture the Queen, the government and the Army High Command had failed completely. Meanwhile, the fight on the Gebberberg continued. The first and the second line had been taken by the enemy and the third line, the stop line, was under heavy attack. Dutch High Command ordered a counter attack. However, this attack was doomed from the start. First of all, there was a lack of men and the men that were available were fairly old, in their 30s, not the best men to perform a counter attack. 
these men hadn't slept or eaten properly for days. Proper maps of the terrain were not available and aerial support was minimal. Reluctantly, the Dutch defenders performed a counter-attack and they ran into SS troops. After some fighting, they retreated and because of panic this retreat became a rout. The German attackers mopped up the final defenses on the Gebeberg and the Dutch high command decided the following day that they would retreat to the third line. I'm talking about the new Holland water line. However, this line was barely prepared for any defense. Now, however successful, the Germans were behind schedule. In the north, the Germans were not able to break through. I get to that in a second. Also, the battle on the Gebeberg caused some severe delay to the German advance. And in Rotterdam, the fighting had been going on for days now. The German troops were pinned down. The resistance needed to be broken. Dutch army commander of Rotterdam, Colonel Scharro, then received a German request to surrender the city of Rotterdam or face demolition by bombing. However, this request was not signed. Scharot argued he couldn't just give up the city for an unsigned request. Now, the mayor of Rotterdam, Peter Aalt, he said that the fate of the country was more important than the fate of Rotterdam. However, if the fate of the country was already sealed, the city of Rotterdam needed to be spared. Dutch Supreme Commander, General Winkelmann, he agreed with Scharot. So therefore, they asked for a new signed request and also to postpone the ultimatum. But by that time, German bombing planes were already on their way. Flares should have been fired in order to cancel the bombing. But because of miscommunication, these flares were not fired. And so, the historical city center of Rotterdam was bombed flat. And 800 Dutch civilians died in this. Now, one place the Germans did not manage to take was in the north of the Netherlands at the Afsluitdijk. There, the Dutch garrison managed to fend off several German attacks. And when, on the 15th of May, the news of the conditional Dutch surrender reached them, these Dutch soldiers were in shock and awe. When the Dutch commander met the German commander to surrender himself, he said to the commander, understand, the only reason for laying down my arms is because of orders of high command, not because of any strategic circumstances. You are still outside my position and remain to do so for many days to come. On the 15th of May 1940, the Dutch high command had signed the unconditional surrender to Germany. The Queen and the Dutch government had fled to England, but for the Dutch civilians, the occupation had begun. Now there's much more to say about the Battle of the Netherlands and if you have some additional information you want to share feel free to leave it in a comment down below. I'm thinking of shooting separate episodes about the separate battles that have been fought during the German invasion of the Netherlands so if you'd like to see that let me know in the comments down below. If you would like to know more about how the Netherlands lost their colony, the Dutch East Indies, to the Japanese. You can click right here to check out the video I made about that. Do not forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.